Welcome to this week's episode of Everyday Thin Places. I'm Rachel Gallagher, and I'm an interfaith hospice chaplain. And I'm Elizabeth Ferrasso, and I'm a birth doula. And in each episode of Everyday Thin Places, we draw from our experiences supporting birthing people and dying people to explore with honesty, authenticity, and humor how we can all become more truly living people. Okay, we didn't plan to speak on this topic today. In fact, you will see that while we're releasing this as a bonus episode, alongside our regularly scheduled release, you're actually getting two episodes for for one today. Uh, But yeah, uh, it just seemed appropriate and important to pause and to interject and to create space to have a conversation about a timely topic. Along with that, it only seems appropriate to offer a content warning. We are going to talk about the murder of George Floyd. This won't be a graphic conversation, but I guess it's fair to say it's an emotionally graphic conversation. And I know there are some people out there who are already wearied and worn thin under the burden of 400 years of violence against black bodies in America, and you just can't right now. So please don't. Please jump ahead to our next episode and enjoy it as an opportunity for self-care. But for those who can, especially for those who are just waking up to the reality of our country's deep-rooted and widespread problem with systemic racial inequality, please listen on. Yeah, so 2020, what a year, right? Um, it feels like a lifetime ago, but it was back in the beginning of February. I checked my calendar February 6th, to be exact, that the idea of this podcast was conceived. And so back in February, Rachel, we were spending an afternoon together. And you mentioned something about always wanting to have a podcast. Um, And meanwhile, I for years had been brewing this idea of bringing the topic of birth and death together, but I never found a medium to have this conversation that felt like a good fit for me. So long story short, I texted you a few days later and I said, hey, about that podcast idea, you want to, you want to start one with me? So we met weekly, um, weekly or so, so that we could plot and we could plan. And somewhere along the way, we started hearing more about this coronavirus thing. Um, pretty soon here in Philadelphia, we were under a shelter in place order. And so you coming to my house to sit on the couch and meet with me while my toddler was napping turned into us planning FaceTime calls. And as we sorted through the heaviness and the emotions and the fallout from a global pandemic, we wondered if a podcast with glittery artwork belonged in a world reckoning with hundreds of thousands of deaths. But we set our release for June. We hoped that by June 1st, we would be ready to share our podcast and that maybe the world would be ready for us. June seemed when maybe, it seemed like maybe the world would be returning to some kind of new normal and maybe people would be returning to work again and they might listen to our podcast on their commute on the way to work. But then when June 1st came, The global pandemic felt like old news, and something seemingly even more acute was taking over the 24-hour news cycle. And it wasn't just on the news. uh, It was outside of our own doors. Yeah. You see, just a few days prior to June 1st, a young man, George Floyd, was arrested on a charge of passing a counterfeit $20 bill at a grocery store in Minneapolis. And after the clerk called the police about the fake $20 bill, A white police officer, Derek Chauvin, pressed his knee to Floyd's neck for nearly nine minutes while arresting him. We won't go into all of the graphic details of Floyd's death, but the official autopsy classified it as a homicide caused by subdual and restraint. And this was all caught on video by onlookers and by the footage that they took on their cell phones. And it quickly went viral. Of course, all of this was only a couple weeks after the public lynching of Ahmaud Arbery. And stories of Breonna Taylor had just come out about her being killed by a police officer in her own home. 
These were the headlines just two months earlier. And after Floyd's death, protests were held globally against the use of excess force by police officers and lack of police accountability. By the time June 1st rolled around, protests had spread from Minneapolis to our doorsteps in Philadelphia. Yeah, so on June 1st, the day that we had set on the calendar when we were going to release our trailer and we were going to begin two weeks of trying to gather attention for ourselves and momentum for our big June 15th launch day, um, we were right on the heels of one of the most acutely painful and unsettling days that I've ever experienced in my 20 years of living in Philadelphia. Um, Not only were we feeling the weightiness alongside of the Black community of another another life stolen. Um, But we weren't just watching this on the news. We were experiencing the intensity of the emotions firsthand. We had a a front row seat. Um, Rachel, even though you and I live in different neighborhoods, we both were very, we both live very close to some of the hot spots of the demonstrations that erupted. And I actually could see my own house on some of the live feeds of the news helicopters that were documenting the events. And I could smell the fires from my porch. And, um, it was simply because the wind was blowing south instead of north that we were spared the effects of tear gas that. I and the neighbors on my block because other neighbors to the south who were just peacefully sitting on their porch um, suffered the effects of the tear gas from the police coming right to their their front porch where they were sitting. Um, So I actually had a client whose water had broken early that morning of June 1st, and I wasn't sure between the demonstrations and looting and the response from law enforcement. The, The city actually... Um, decided that they they put a curfew in place. And so I, my my phone went off with the alert that's usually an Amber Alert. And I looked down and realized that we were um, all being warned that we had to stay in. They were setting a curfew at 6 p.m. So here I had a mom in labor, and I wasn't sure if I'd be able to get to her or not. Well, actually, so she wasn't in labor. Her water had broken, and we were waiting for labor. So it turns out that her labor sort of waited and I got half decent sleep even with all the sirens and these mysterious explosions that we still continued to hear for days and weeks. Um, That was my sleep soundtrack. And as it turned out, I got the call to join them at um, right before 6 a.m. as the curfew was was rising. So jumped in my car, um, scattered shoe boxes, all over the place. Actually, by the time I came home, the National Guard was uh, posted right on our corner. And it all felt so surreal. On the one hand, it was beautiful and validating to witness how many people cared, how many people were saying enough is enough, and to watch these uprisings all around the country. And these uprisings that would eventually spread all around the world. And to see that people are saying white supremacy is real and it's an issue. And racial inequality and police brutality have hit this tipping point where everyone was collectively saying enough. Um, But it was also just so heartbreaking and so heavy. And if I'm honest, like being so up close to it where you can ignore it, it was unsettling. It was, it was kind of scary. And so in this circumstance, we wondered, what do we do? Do we still release this podcast trailer? Do we still clog up Instagram with all these canva graphics that we created to say um look at this new podcast that we're creating um this is a time where we realized it is most important for everyone who has a platform to use their platforms to amplify the voices of black people of indigenous people of people of color and so so we talked we talked on the phone you i guess you probably remember some of those conversations yeah we sent lots of text messages back and forth. We jumped on a bunch of phone calls and we discussed the pros and cons of moving ahead with our plans. And ultimately, we settled on the fact that what is happening in the world at this particular moment is likely the defining event of our generation. And what a time to facilitate the engagement of conversations that could potentially change society for the better. Our vision for this podcast has always been to produce dynamic content that will move people emotionally and to cultivate a community where people can have honest, authentic, and transformative conversations. So we decided to keep our momentum going. 
we decided to share our weeks ago created Instagram posts daily, and we decided to launch with our first three episodes that we recorded in May because we knew eventually we would have the opportunity to speak and to use this platform to show you, our listeners, what our values are. We know that anyone who sticks around long enough is going to figure out what we are all about. And we figure that our early listeners are likely to be the kind of people who already know and love us. Our values are going to be reflected in the long run in our conversations and in our choice of topics and in our choice of guests. But it seems right that if a couple of white girls are going to release a podcast in June of 2020, we might as well take the chance to explicitly let our listeners know what our values are, what our intentions are, and what impact we hope to have. Yeah. So you would figure this out if you are going to stick around. Um, But we want to explicitly say for you here from the very beginning that because Rachel and I are a pair of white, cis, hetero, able-bodied, financially secure women who both have roots in the Christian faith tradition, that we see this podcast as a place for us to purposefully and intentionally have conversations with people who come from different experiences. From the beginning, we've said that for every guest who matches one of our demographics, we need to have three who represent another identity or another experience. In part, this is because we believe that the concept of thin places is a universal concept. So we know that there are really rich conversations to be had with anybody and everybody about how they experience everyday thin places. So we would be doing our podcast a disservice if we didn't purposely seek out the voices of people of every race, of every religion, of no religion, people of every socioeconomic group, people of every sexual orientation, and people who are everywhere along the spectrum of gender identity. But we especially especially want to say here and now that we intend to use this platform to amplify the voices of Black people, of Indigenous people, and of people of color. So sure, we're we're saying something that every brand from Ikea to Quaker Foods to Target is saying right now, right? Um, And it it could just come off as joining the bandwagon to make this claim. Um, We do think, like we said, if we never explicitly said this, our listeners would figure this out. But as it turns out, one of the recent conversations that you and I were having about birth and death and podcasting very naturally turned into a conversation about the death of George Floyd. So we want to talk about that today. And we want to make the place that we stand in support of the Black Lives Matter movement and in support of of dismantling systemic racism and white supremacy, and in the centering of BIPOC voices abundantly clear. Um, So at first, you might sort of wonder where we're going as we share this story with you, but I promise it will come back around. Um, Because, Rachel, we were talking last week about a question that I had asked you during a practice recording that I neglected to ask you when we did the actual recording where I and the episode where I interviewed you about your job as a chaplain. So I, it was, I thought a good question. I kind of am sad that it didn't make it into that episode. So we were chatting about it and here's how it went. Um, so you talked about your personal belief that there has to be some sort of afterlife of sorts, which leads me to question something that I've heard about death. And um, I've heard from many people that when they're approaching death, they report seeing or hearing or interacting in some way with their loved ones. And I've heard a handful of these stories. I wonder if you, as someone who is around dying people regularly, I wanted you to tell me, is that is that something you could vouch for? Is that really true? So that's the question I asked. And, and then what did you tell me? Oh, yes. <laughs> so this is a phenomenon that we see a lot in hospice. And it's actually uncanny how much we see this. In many, many situations, when a person is getting really close to the end of life, it's really common for the dying person to experience the presence of loved ones who have already died. 
And when they're able to express this experience to those of us around them, it's clear that there is something otherworldly going on. Here's the thing. It's never just the person's long lost cousin who lives on the other side of the country. It's always someone who has already died. So that leads us to believe that it's not just the dying brain firing neurons and causing the dying person to hallucinate. It seems as if there's someone who has already died, who is there to comfort the dying person during that time, whether it's a parent, a spouse, or even sometimes a beloved pet. Yeah. Um, yeah, the the story that I heard that made me think of this, I remembered um, an interview with Bishop Carlton Pearson. Uh, he tells this story about how when his father was dying, um, they're all gathered around him and he kept saying, um, oh, she's so beautiful. She's so beautiful. And they're asking him, you know, what are you talking about? And he said, um, She's so beautiful. She just she looks just like our other sister. And he was seeing and interacting with his daughter, who had only lived for 14 hours. So his whole uh, Bishop Pearson talks about how his whole life, if he would ever say that he was one of six, his mom would say seven, one of seven, because they had had this oldest sister who had only lived 14 hours and his dad never talked about her his whole life but then when he was dying it was the first time they ever heard him talk about this sister and how beautiful she was and how she looked just like their other sister and so that piqued my curiosity and um, I've often heard about it being a parental figure that people see sort of like your mother is there when you come into life. And so some people see their mother when it's time to leave. Um, I think that came from reading the book Holding Space by Amy Wright Glenn and taking a course with her where so often it's like sort of mirrors life where your mother is there when you, uh, obviously when you were born, (laughs) your mother is there. And that a lot of people will experience the presence of their mother if their mother has passed on before. And so I was like, Rachel, it's just something you've heard about. Um, And then you said something that just sucked all the air out of the room because it's so powerful. Um, So Rachel, (laughs) have you heard about people having experiences with their mother when they're dying? I have. And this is the conversation that brought us back to George Floyd. I watched the brutally painful cell phone video of Officer Chauvin pressing his knee into Floyd's neck for eight minutes and 46 seconds. The entire ordeal broke me as a human. But the part that undid me completely was when Floyd called out to his mother. It was in that moment that all of my work in hospice flashed before my eyes. I was actually thinking, that's it. That's how you know he's about to die. Do something. You're about to kill him and you know it. He's exhibiting the signs of actively dying. So when you said that, um, obviously that was something I had never thought of. Um, I honestly have not watched the video because I was so undone just by reading the reports of the video's content. And I was so gutted when I heard those reports of him calling for his mother. But I assumed, I assumed the first time I heard that, that his mother was still alive as if he were crying out for her help, crying out for her to intervene. Um, So for your perspective, it just shed a whole new light on this. And I think it's so important to share. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I knew nothing about her when I initially watched that video. But when I heard him cry out to her like that, in that moment, There was no doubt in my mind that she had gone before him. And I guess if I'm to find any comfort in any part of what happened to George Floyd, I have to tell myself 
that in that moment she was there with him a presence from beyond to comfort him in that darkest moment and i truly think that part of the reason why we have reached a tipping point collectively is because George Floyd called out to his mother. Obviously, it's um, impacted us, but it impacted everybody. And let's be honest, there is a disgustingly large number of videos floating out there of unarmed men, unarmed black men, black boys dying at the hands of law enforcement. This is nothing new. And this could have just been one more, but it wasn't just one more. Um, I think maybe this is part of the explanation is as I've read reports and seen the memes and just had conversations with people, something happened when George Floyd called for his mama, the heart of every mama heard it and responded. And even, you know, even as we shed these tears as humans right now, um, I realize that there is a unique terror and there is a constant anxiety that only a black mama will know. I think, though, for the first time, a preponderance of all mothers are beginning to understand and even just that mothering nature that is innate and in, in living inside of all humans. That's starting to come alive and that's what's responding. And because, Rachel, you're you're not a mother, but you feel it. And I mean, what's more universally human than the fact that we all have a mother? So I don't know. What do you think? What are your thoughts on that? That's exactly right. I mean, even those of us who aren't mothers ourselves, and those who have complicated relationships with our own mothers can relate to that primal need to connect with something motherly in times of deep despair. And seeing and hearing George Floyd cry out for that is now cemented in our collective psyche. So this is an important conversation to have. Um, it felt so powerful when you and I talked about this. And that's why I wanted to have this conversation again with the microphones on so that our listeners could have that same unique perspective. Um, but here's the deal. If you wondered whether we in this podcast wanted to enter into difficult conversations, um, clearly we do, because here we are um, offering this bonus episode, and we want to use it to unequivocally state that Black lives matter. This also means that we believe that when we focus on the thresholds of life, of birth and death, we want to pay special attention to the experiences of Black people, of Indigenous people, and people of color. So you're not going to hear us say once. You're not going to hear us say twice. You're not going to hear us say only three times that we have a crisis in our country when it comes to maternal health care for Black women. We're going to take every opportunity to use this platform to do our part to ensure that Black bodies are honored and are protected in birth, and in death. Because how can we have a podcast about truly living if we aren't purposely extending our vision to a part of the human family whose lives have been systematically devalued? Yeah, for the immediate weeks ahead, we want to be mindful to giving space to Black people, Indigenous people, and people of color who we plan on featuring on this podcast. Because it's just not fair or right to ask them to give of their time and emotion for our benefit right now. We want to be part of their restoration and healing. And we want to be a part of calling other white people to learn and mark our words. We will be featuring their voices on this podcast. Yeah, these folks are currently hurting and tired. And even though there is a sense of validation in having so many people join the uprising, there's so much pain. Um, One of my dearest friends doesn't 
really care about podcasts, but she's been listening to ours because she loves me and she wants to support me. But the reason I even thought to put a content warning on this episode is because yesterday in a conversation, she mentioned, quote, that man, because she's unable to even say the name George Floyd without falling into pieces and tears overcoming her. So some people are listening for the first time. Some people are open for the first time and have a whole lot of questions. But we don't want to ask the BIPOC folks in our lives to do that work for us. There's good news, though. Many of them have already done the work. And whether you learn by reading books, listening to podcasts, or watching movies, there are countless resources where we can all be learning from. So some resources that I've been utilizing recently are the book, Why Are All the Black Kids Sitting Together in the Cafeteria? by Dr. Beverly Daniel Tatum. And the podcast, Higher Learning, with Van Lathan and Rachel Lindsay. Um, I've really appreciated following someone named Oshita Moore. She's on Instagram. She's on Facebook. I believe she's also on Twitter. Um, She is a peacemaker through and through. Uh, But she doesn't just make peace by making nice. She calls things out that need to change. And she um, she has had some of the most powerful, the most powerful things to say. And I think maybe the most approachable, especially for someone who's brand new to this. She's kind and gentle to people that are new and really wants to bring them along. Um, And I really enjoyed listening to the podcast interview on Brene Brown's podcast, where she interviewed Austin Channing Brown, who's the author of I'm Still Here. Uh, So that book, Brene talks about it as a book that has wings because she threw it across the room so many times reading it. Um, So whether you have, you know, pick up that book, uh, I think if you listen to the podcast, you're going to want to pick up the book as well. And Austin Channing Brown is an amazing voice. Um, But there are so many more. You can Watchmen is on HBO for free right now. Um, The film Just Mercy is available for free right now. Some things that you would usually have to pay to have access to. Um, What else, Rachel? Well, there's just so many resources. Yeah. Um, So why don't we put a bunch of those links on our website? Yeah. Um, And you can check out a lot more of our recommendations there. I mean, not just our recommendations, like people that have been at this for a long time that have 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 cultivated lists of um, here's where to start. Here's where to dig deeper. Here's how to really get into it. And so we'll post links to those to those lists on our show notes. And I think we both really strongly believe that conversations are transformational. Absolutely. And we want to provide space for conversations. So this week, we're launching our closed Facebook group, and we would love to continue this conversation there with all of our listeners. Yeah. So one of the things that we thought about when we decided to create a closed Facebook group is that everybody has everybody has at some point been the victim of a troll on Facebook, right? And I'm a very sensitive person. So when I first thought about having a podcast, I thought, let's have a community and let's have conversations, but how do we make it a safe place? And the way that we thought we could do that is to have an exclusive closed Facebook group. And we were going to ask people to be a part of our financial team to do our the way that it's set up on our website is to um, buy us a virtual cup of coffee, which is a $3 gift towards our podcast. And so we knew that anybody that had three bucks to give had skin in the game and could come and be a really meaningful part of that conversation. Um, so That is how to get in the Facebook group. But um, we don't want your $3 for ourselves this week. We still want you to buy us a virtual cup of coffee in order to show that you've got some skin in the game to join this group. And then all of the money raised this week with those $3 cup of coffee donations are going to be given to the Equal Justice Initiative. So that is the um, initiative created by Brian Stevenson, who's featured in the film just mercy. So enjoy one of those resources. 
come talk about it with us. Come talk with us, not just about this, but about all the other episodes that we've produced up to this point. We want to have a dialogue. We, I mean, we're excited to have these microphones and we're excited (laughs) to put this, put our voices and our thoughts and things that are really precious to us out into the world. But we don't want this to be a one-way conversation. We want to be able to create a community where people can have conversations about really meaningful topics that are going to help them to live a life that is truly living. So you can enjoy the other episode that we're putting out today. Do some self-care You can go to our website, everydaythinplaces.com, on the Donate tab, buy us a virtual cup of coffee. We will, from your contact information, add you to the private exclusive Facebook group, and then we'll be passing all that money along to the Equal Justice Initiative. Thank you so much for being with us today, for engaging in these difficult conversations, and for being willing to learn and listen We look forward to more of these conversations. Thanks for joining us. Now it's our turn to hear from you. So would you do us a big favor and go into your podcast app and rate us? Even better, would you write us a glowing review? That will help other listeners to find us. And make sure to subscribe so that you don't miss a single episode. You can also visit our website at everydaythinplaces.com, where you will find all sorts of fun and interesting information, as well as learn about how you can help to support this podcast and earn special exclusive perks. There you will also find links to follow us on social media, or else just pop directly over to Instagram or Facebook, where you will find us at Everyday Thin Places. Thanks so much for joining us today. Until next time, I'm Elizabeth. And I'm Rachel. Bye. Bye.